Dark Cast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasts. Life is messy. You might as well have some fun with it. If you're new here, this is True Crime Connections Advocacy Podcast. My name is Tiffany, and I am your host. This week, we are getting down and dirty with Marcy Warhaft. She's here to share her story of how going through some very traumatic events by battling an eating disorder, the loss of her brother, she was very easily manipulated into some pretty scandalous sexcapades with her husband. Stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss this. Well, thank you so much for being here with me today, Marcy. I've been excited to talk to you all day. Yeah, I'm excited too. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. So I read your book, The Good Stripper, and I have nothing but amazing things to say. Literally. I laughed so much throughout the book. Like, you could tell you were still back in those presents. Like, it was just like, mm. what in the actual fuck is happening? And I was like, I could feel that. <laughs> I know. That's the thing. The other title could have been, what the fuck? But I don't know how well that would have. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you never like, know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad you liked it. And it, I'm yeah. glad it made you feel something. Yeah. Yes. It even, I mean... It, it was sad, you know, losing your brother, losing your mom. That was very emotional. And so that, that made me tear up a little bit. But, you know, I think that you are a remarkable woman. So I think what you're doing is amazing. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I don't honestly, I don't, I don't think that I'm any more remar- remarkable than anyone else. It's funny because people will say to anyone who's gone, who's gone through a lot, you know, they'll always say, you're so strong, you're so strong in it. I always feel like I think I'm stronger than anybody else. I just had to prove it. You know, and there are a lot of us like that. I think that a lot of us don't know how strong we are. A lot of us are strong. It's just that some of us have to prove it and keep proving it and keep proving. And and one thing I've said before is that I think the reason why a lot of us are strong is because we didn't feel safe. And so we had to become strong. And if I'm going to be perfectly honest, given the choice, I'd rather feel safe than have to be strong. I'd rather, I wish I didn't know how much I could go through, you know, I wish, I wish I had no idea <laughs> that I could go through a lot of bad stuff and come out of it. Okay. Like, I wish I had no clue, but I, I, I had no choice. And that's kind of what, what happens. You really have no choice. So I no, just, absolutely. I put one front of the other. Yeah. You don't know how strong you are until you have to be it. So that's it. Yeah. And, and, and the lucky ones never, never have to find out. Right. So after the loss of, your brother and your mother and a child, your husband thought it would be a great idea to start swinging. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think um, I, I, I don't want to speak for him and I, and I don't like to talk about him too much. It, we're in an amicable situation. We share children. Um, and it's my, my former husband. Important. Yes. I, uh, yeah. I, look, I think we're people. We're human. And you, you go into a relationship with somebody. We were very young when we met. We were in our early twenties. Uh, I think I was 21, maybe when we met and 22. And you don't really know who you are. Never mind who the other person is. I certainly didn't. I'd been through so much and was trying to find some normalcy and this seemed normal, seemed normal. And I, then I think you, you, you grow and you evolve and things happen. And then sometimes you, you, you're different than you thought or the person that you're with is different than you thought. And things can happen in a very odd way. And yeah, we've been through a lot. And for some reason, he had gotten into this. Uh, I don't know. He, he, had, before I went through all the losses, he had sort of brought up opening up our marriage and I wasn't, it wasn't something I was into. Um, and then it came up again later when I'd been through a lot. And at that point, I was feeling very defeated. I was also going through this weird thing of like where I was feeling I just had my second baby. Um, I'd lost three pregnancies. And I was feeling not postpartum, but I remember calling my doctor and being like, something's not, 
I felt off. Something was off, which makes sense because I've been through a lot of trauma, both emotionally, but also physically. I'd been really sick and spent time in the hospital just prior and had a baby and, and something was just not right. And that's when it, when he brought it up again. And I just didn't, I didn't have it in me to kind of go, Hmm, is this a good idea? I don't think so. And I was feeling, I was still struggling with um, an eating disorder that I had started when I was 17, when I lost my brother. At this point, I was in my early 30s. And I, everything was just like this perfect storm that kind of hit. And I was like, okay. And um, I often say I confused, I confused being sexual with being sexualized. And I'd always been a sexual person, had a very healthy outlook on sex. Um, but I was, ever since I was 17, I never felt good enough to be part of the world and was looking for ways to prove my worth. And at that point, I sort of felt like, well, there's nothing really special about me, but maybe I can find some self-worth through my body. And, and I didn't feel, I felt that I had lost, except for my children, I had lost everyone who really loved me. So maybe the next best thing is just to be wanted. And that was all I really was looking for at that time. And it just, it took a, it took its toll because that became really my identity was, and and that's why it's sort of this double life in my book. It's me really trying to be the best mother that I could because I had what I felt was the best mother for 28 years of my life. And I really, really, really adored my children and still do. But I, I wanted them to feel loved every second. Like I just wanted every memory to be amazing. And so that was my goal for them. But at the same time, I was also feeling like nothing as my own person and found this while I could feel empowered sexually and started acting out that way. And so there was like this, you know, trying to be the perfect mom, but then also being kind of like the town tramp. <laughs> <laughs> when I, when I wasn't with them, which is hilarious now, but not so funny at the time. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> It's exhausting, if nothing else. <laughs> oh my god, I love that you referred him as idiot. <laughs> that no, that was no. Okay, so idiot. That's not my my ex. Idiot was the was the oh, no, was no, like, was the friend. I know, isn't that funny? I mean, I didn't know that they keep that in there, but yeah. Well, you know, I had to hide identities, but idiot was the first person that my uh, my ex husband wanted me to uh, be with. A friend of his. Yeah, because that's how I felt. I felt like he was a bit of an idiot. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I needed the nickname. No, no harm. It's just. Right. No, it's just every time I just like chuckled a little bit. I'm telling you, like your book was, it was hilarious. I just, I loved it. <laughs> I think you're the first person that <laughs> that's described it to me like that mostly for like i couldn't read it i had to make sure like that you're okay first that you you know and you're like it's so hilarious <laughs> well, it's, look, at your, look at your podcast it's <laughs> true true crime stuff i mean <laughs> it's kind of on point so there you go exactly and that's pretty much like where this episode kind of goes it's because like you were feeling a certain way you know, obviously you just had a baby. So, you know, you have so much on your mind, on, on your body, everything. And you wanted to feel sexy. You wanted to feel appreciated. You wanted to feel loved. And so when he was like, Hey, let's try this. I mean, you weren't like, woohoo, let's go for it. But you're like, at one point, fuck it. I, th I think you might have even said that. <laughs> well, yeah. I think, well, you know what I think too is that this person in particular, was somebody who, who was attracted to me, somebody who did, who was interested in me. And so even though I, I didn't think super highly of him, which is another reason why he chose him was because he knew I didn't like him. So he didn't see him as a threat, like an ongoing threat. But so I, but here was somebody who cared about me in some way, you know what I mean? Who, who liked me. And so there, there was, an appeal to that. I think that's, that was an insecurity. I was, I had huge insecurities. And I, again, like we had said, I lost my mother, my brother. I, at the time, I didn't have a relationship with my sister. My father was out of the picture, didn't grow up with any extended family. So it was just me. And so that was all I had. And so, yeah, there was something, it was something, you know, it was somebody who was dying to see me. It was somebody who was dying to spend time with me. It was somebody who was complimenting me. And it sounds kind of pathetic, but really, 
it was this little, little bit, you know, that was, that I kind of needed. And, uh, so I, I kind of fell for it. And the thing is with my body too, is I had been so disconnected from my body for so long because between the eating disorder that started when I, when I was 17 and then just before all of this happened, when, when we started swinging, um, I had just maybe two years before that had gotten very ill and had spent two months in the hospital with a near fatal, um, illness. And so my body had been so foreign to me for so long. I had been so disconnected and then I had a baby. And even at, at that time too, you don't really know. And I was pregnant when I was sick and lost that baby. And you're like, I didn't understand my body at all. And I was very, very, very disconnected to my body. So sharing it wasn't, it, I, I didn't feel like I was, you know, giving myself to, cause I was here, you know, my head was here, my body was there. So it was kind of an easy thing to give myself physically because I was so detached. Right. And it made you feel good. And that's at that point, that's what you're chasing. Yeah. I don't know that I can. I mean, it's <laughs> you. I don't know that it made me feel good. I, I think there got to a point and I, and I talk about this, how there's one person in particular, but there, there were a few people I was with that I, I used as punishment because I felt like I was such a bad person for doing all of that, that I had to prove to myself how terrible I was. So I would sleep with sleep and have sex with this one person in particular because I knew he didn't think much of me and I didn't think much of him. And it was my way of punishing myself. And so it, it wasn't that, oh, this is going to be so much fun. It was like, I'm such a terrible person. So I, I, I often say because with, between the eating disorder and the way I acted out sexually, I abused myself with both food and sex two things that I really enjoy, you know, but I, at the time really used in a, in a negative way. So I can't, I can't really say I I enjoyed it. I, it was, I I was looking, I was looking for, I think I liked the attention. I liked the attention, but it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't, it was okay. (laughs) (laughs) It wasn't a, oh shit, what's that movie? Oh my god, every woman is going to kill me. Gray shit. Oh yeah, no. Oh, but <laughs> yeah. Even the swinging club was so different than I different than I kind of imagined and uh, Yeah, I mean, look, it, it looking back, I'm okay. So it's it I could say I don't regret the dancing. I don't regret I don't regret anything except what I will always regret always, and I don't have a problem with regretting this, is that there were some of my actions that negatively impacted other people and hurt other people and um, other women. And even though I know now that it's really like my responsibility, and um, I will always regret that. And I will always um, just never feel okay about that. And I, and I shouldn't. And I'm okay with never. I don't hate myself for it anymore. I used to really hate myself for years over mistakes that I made like that. And I, and I don't. I understand why and it was never in my head I wasn't even thinking that but as soon as I realized oh shit you're hurting other people I stopped it but um you know it's it it's it, that that's the only thing the other things are we're using memories and look they're trying to help be doing something and I'll get this flashback and I'll be like oh <laughs> 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 but uh but you know it's been a full life what can you say what can you say absolutely well, I got to tell you, I loved your song choices for when you danced. I was like, she's picking all the good ones. <laughs> hey, there's a variety of, of stuff in there. I mean, yeah, it was interesting. Well, I was also like, so I was um, freelancing. So I wasn't there all the time. And there was, you know, I had to be careful. You couldn't pick other people's songs that, you know, people had their set list and you couldn't do that. And I was very careful about what I didn't want to step in any house. And, you know, the club only had you know, certain genres that they didn't want. And, so I always take songs. I always like to dance. That was my favorite part. And so it, uh, I always pick songs that, that I like to dance. Like I actually dance. Like, I actually dance. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I think songs that are fun. Yeah. yeah. I can only imagine. I mean, I've been to strip clubs and, you know, you sit and you watch the girls work the floor. And I always wondered, like, what went on in their head when they're doing this. And I know it's, it's money. <laughs> For the most part, who's got the deep pockets? But I was, yeah, I wasn't even good at that enough. I was like, I think I could go back. I was so subconscious and so 
I, 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 I wish I was just more savvy. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, anyone who says, I don't know, like, it's, it's, the women are uncovered. I mean, a, a different clubs are different for sure and whatever, but yeah, you no, know, it's any guy who goes into strip club and thinks, oh, she likes me. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I remember even my, my sister that I used to say that, that he thought that strip clubs were the safest, for, like if her husband was saying you go to strip club and the wife said, worry, don't worry. Like, unless it's certain, again, certain clubs, my club wasn't like that, but there are certain clubs where you could get extra if you want, I'm sure. And certain girls you can get extra. But for the most part, you're not, they just, they, yeah, they're, it's a job. They're there to make money. They're going to entertain you. But that's, yeah, they're not dancing for you because you're so goddamn attractive and they're going to fall in love with you before the end of the night. Not going to Right. No, yeah. absolutely not. They're there with one goal in mind and it ain't you. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, and, and every, every, I, I wouldn't speak for the dancers, every dance is different. Everyone has their own motivation. And, you know, but I, I, I know that uh, people will see the title in the book and sometimes they'll say, oh, you know, don't worry. I knew a dancer. Don't worry. And I'm like, I'm not worried. Like, I don't. I don't look down on anybody who dances for any period of time for any reason. I just don't. I think there are a lot of reasons in the world to be ashamed. There are a lot of things that people do that are just me spirited and hateful and, and, and just run and, and dancing for money and taking off your clothes. Ugh. I will, I don't think any, any person should feel ashamed or should be shamed for doing that. I mean, really look, look at, at the, the condition of the world and please dancing, stripping, please. That's. Right. It's okay. It's okay. And everyone has a story. There's obviously every girl who's there has a story. Nobody wakes up one day and it's just like, mm, I think I'm going to go dance on a pole. You know what I mean? Like something brings you there. So to you as her husband. <laughs> <laughs> that, that wasn't not his. Okay. In a way, it wasn't his. That was not his. Um, suggestion at all. He didn't, when I brought it up, and he didn't want me to do it at first, and then was happy because I was helping with the, the household, with the grocery show thing and all that, because I was working before I had my two little kids. So I was able to contribute, so it was like that. But, um, but at first, you know, it was, it was my idea because I was paying for personal training. I mean, just like, but when people say to me, again, people who haven't read the book, they'll say, oh, you know what, you were just, you were just doing what you had to do to put food on the table because that's such a kind of cliche. And I'm like, yeah, listen, they put food on the table. You know, I have to a good job. <laughs> you know, it was much less respectable than that. <laughs> it, was just, it was ridiculous. But I was also, I was in such a weird, crazy place at the time. I mean, I was just not to myself. I, I said before, I, I said in the book, there were t- there's times I would look at myself, literally look at myself in the mirror. And not recognize myself and say, who are you? You know, I mean, I really was so almost dissociated from myself. And so um, I, I call it my crazy time, but it's just that I, I absolutely did things that I never would have done had circumstances not led me to them. But yeah, we don't know anyone's story. And who are we to judge? I don't exactly. Know. And you were Cassidy then. That's who you were. Cassidy. <laughs> Yeah, I think I heard that name on like a TV show for the girls. It's really pretty and it's stuck in my head forever. So, yeah, I like it. I love that. You're a little alter ego. Mm-hmm. You're like, whenever Marcy would like go down, Cassidy came, she rose to the occasion. <laughs> it, is, it is weird sometimes to think like, that was me. I did that. It's weird. Like you look back at your life and there are things and... <laughs> And that, that, that stuff is part of my past is, is, yeah, it's, and it's so weird too, because it is something that I kept so hidden. I mean, the dancing plus the extracurriculars and, and all that stuff. It, it's, I really, I, I kept those secrets guarded because I had children and all that and terrified that it would come out. And then I ended up writing a book, <laughs> you know, my kids are so supportive and it's so great, but all that fear, you know, and now I look at it, it's, it's, Look, I, I say this all the time when people say they're reading my book and there's a part of me that's always like, oh, God, they're going to know me really, really well, you know, and it's, what are they going to think? And it's a, and then we'll go back and I'll read parts of it and go, oh, my God, I can't believe I said that. 
So it's kind of, but then at the same time, it's also very liberating because nobody can, I can't, you know, who's going to embarrass me with anything. Nobody's going to shame me with anything. It's, you can't, I can't change the path. I could, you could try to hide it, but it's there. So the things I did, I did, you know, and, and writing the book actually made me, helped me understand why I did some of the things I did. And that was very, very helpful. But like I said before, in the grand scheme of things, the only person that I really hurt was myself. Uh, I was very careful not to hurt my children. I just, my partner and I had a very, you know, he and I had a very odd relationship. And so I, it, it, he was fine. It, so, and then again, I said there were a couple people that I, that I inadvertently hurt and I will always feel bad for that. But, you know, it was my life that I put in danger several times. It was, it was my well being that, that I put at risk all the time. And, and so I feel bad. And I used to look back at sort of my Cassidy time and, and really not like that person at all and feel a ton of shame. And, and now I don't. Now I just feel kind of, I want to like, <laughs> I'm going to like hug her and go, you're, baby, you're better than this guy. You know, like pick yourself up, move forward. Um, but I have a lot more empathy. And I think that's what we have to do as human beings. I think a lot of times people get stuck in the past. And I think, I think the reason why that happens in life, we're supposed to grow, we're supposed to change, we're supposed to learn. And I think what we do because I've been to a lot of people since my book came out who are stuck with some of the stuff that they did. They just feel so bad. They can't get past it. And I think the reason that happens is because you were looking at the stuff that we did then with the growth that we have now. So now if I look back, right, and I go, oh, my God, how did I do that? Why would I do it? Well, of course, because now I've grown my change. So I would never do that again. That's not the way I would react to things. And that's a good thing. But to beat yourself up over what? you did when you didn't know any better that's just not fair so to look at that and go okay that's what i did then what would i do the same thing now no that's the key if you still do it now then you're going to go okay what's going on here but if you say no no of course not i would do something different that's what you're supposed to do you're supposed to grow and so we have to sort of let go of feeling bad and and that's why in my book i dedicated it to anyone who's struggling to forgive themselves for mistakes they made when they were just trying to survive because we're doing the best we can with what we got. And that's it. Oh, absolutely. I I totally believe that. And it's part of the growth process. I mean, if we think about half of the things that either we've said to ourselves or think, oh, my God, some of the things I've done, Jesus Christ, I could write a book. But, you know, <laughs> it's just, you know, you learn, you grow, and you learn more about yourself, I feel like, sometimes when you make some of these mistakes, because there is a reason why we do what we do, you know? Yeah, and I think that we are harder on ourselves than anybody else. I think that I was so prepared, as prepared as I could be without knowing what would come for people to really react negatively to my book, and it didn't happen. And I think I was projecting my feelings about what I did is sort of expecting other people and they and didn't, especially there was things that there were specific things I thought people were going to come at me for and they didn't. They were looking at other things and asking me other things. And, you know, it was, it was so surprising. I remember when, when you do my first book club and it's so silly, but I remember thinking, oh, God, okay, my first book club, they're going to get them all these, it was not good to all, but they're going to get all me for being with people who had wives which is my biggest shame I'm really not happy with it but so the fact that I was with people who were single I thought they were going to their their biggest question was how did you not sleep how do you have two toddlers and you didn't sleep you go two days without sleeping and I'm like that's that's what that <laughs> that's what they did they're like screw this whatever they're like wow we're so tired and we're sleeping how did you not sleep for two days and by the stripping and being around and stripping being around uh so you never know what's going to resonate with people, you know? There are people who come from right. my lived with my father. I never thought that that would be a thing. Like, it's just, it's so interesting. But all I thought, the things, the thing that was, like, killer for me would be killer for everybody else. No, no. <laughs> so that, that's what's so interesting. So, well, yeah, and life are going to screw up. Yeah, maybe, but then what are you doing? Like, I don't know. I think people who don't learn and don't go like probably... Kind of doing the same thing, and that's okay. Like that's a living. There are times when I think, ooh, life like that would be okay, you know. This is kind of like something exotic, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's not. So yeah, but I think um, so. Yeah, I think we just we focus too much on a what we did wrong, and then b 
they judge them what we did wrong and the only person judging us is ourselves. It sounds like such a cliche, but it really is true. That's what I think. Anyway. I agree. So I wondered throughout the book, when you were in the hospital for months, do you think that he was cheating on the side? No. No? No. No, not at all. And and that's one thing I made very clear is that you know, we went, we were married for a very long time and we definitely, definitely went through some kind of a dark, weird phase. Cause there was no, I make it, I always make it very clear that I was never pushed into anything. I was in a, I was, I feel like I was manipulated, but not forced into anything at all. But he was, when I was in the hospital, fantastic. Like I can't, no, like uh, absolutely the best partner that, that he could have been. He was at that time. So I don't have a single negative thing to say about, about that. That was, I was very grateful. I felt terrible that I had put this, you know, again, at, at the time I was 29, we had a 16 month old at home. I was pregnant and I felt terrible. I didn't have family really. And my sister did come up, we were in the other part of the country and she did come over, but she was dealing with stuff and it was a lot on him. And so, no, he was great. It was just, I think that's what, I think that's what was such a, a bit of a mind math for me was that that was in 2000. I went into the hospital in January of 2000 and I came out in like, I guess, March. I don't know exactly when. And I'd lost that baby and then got pregnant again and had my second son in 2001. And that was, it was right. It was that, you know, within a few months that he brought it up. So I think that's what was so, that was the big shocker for me, I think, was that it was, he was so loving and so great. And again, I don't want to, and I, I'm not saying anything negative about him. It was, he was so great at that time. And, and, um, I think for me, what was difficult was that, you know, the, the doctors said that he, they were probably going to lose me. You know, it was, it, it, nobody expected me to, to, to live from this illness. And then I did. And then I get pregnant again. Um, and have a second miracle baby. And then it was so soon after that, that he wanted to share. And I think that was hard for me to understand, I think. And I think that's what was so disheartening, you know, because it wasn't like I was married to this villain, horrible, abusive. It, it wasn't, he wasn't at all. So it was just it was a weird thing. I think it was just something he discovered about himself, this interest in whatever. And I think, I honestly feel like he, he I've, I've said this before. I don't think that there was ever a time when he thought, oh, I want to hurt her. That's not who he is. I just think it was more of a, I want to do this, you know, so I'm going to tell myself she's okay because I want to do it. And, and that, and he's human too, you know, we're, we're all, we're all human. And, um, you know, just it, it, it ended up affecting me really, really badly. Um, but I'm okay. You know, I, I got out of it and, and that, and I wrote a book about it and that's now it's part of my life and that's, <laughs> and it, it hasn't been boring. So that's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, now you're doing amazing things. You know, you started traveling to schools to promote healthy eating. Like that is amazing. I did that for a while. Yeah, I did that for years because I had battled with an eating disorder for so long. And then went into recovery after I got out of all the craziness and I started sleeping and eating and doing all the right things and left all that other stuff. I focused on my family and getting healthy physically, emotionally, psychologically. So I was in recovery from the eating disorder, but I saw how damaging the messages were for kids of all ages. Like my kids were in elementary school at the time. And I mean, the message that they were getting about dieting was just, they were horrible. And so nobody back then was talking about it. This was 2006, 2007. Facebook had just started. There weren't any body positivity or any positive body image, anything, groups or, and nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to go on TV or the radio and talk about eating disorders because they're not glamorous. They're not sexy, you know? So I did because, <laughs> because I'm just like that. And I, and I hated it. And I honestly, I didn't want anyone to, I didn't want another kid to go through what I went through. I didn't want another parent. I mean, I watched my mother deal with a child who just wouldn't eat or, I mean, it's awful. And I just, I, there's nothing worse for a parent than seeing your child in pain and feel like you can't do anything to help them. So I wanted to help parents and teachers. And so I just started speaking out and then it became a program. 
spoke to kids and parents and teachers and, and, you know, any kids group or parent group or, or anything. Cause at the time there, we were not getting the positive messages. So, um, so that's what I did. And I wrote a book for parents called the body image survival guide for parents. So yeah, I don't know. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, you, you, I went through so much of my life. At first, I started off like this little kid who sang and danced and whatever. And then I, I, by, then I thought, yeah, I just have to be as small as possible, make myself as small as possible. You know, I was, wasn't smart enough, pretty enough, anything enough. I'll just be tiny, tiny. And now I can't shut up. And it's, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a great quote. It's never like, ending. <laughs> it is, but it is, but it's like, there's a great quote that goes something like, I'd love to be mysterious, but I can't shut my mouth. <laughs> <You know? laughs> It's like, this is me. (laughs) So there you go. (laughs) Welcome to Creepy Tapas, the show where two spooky best friends give you tiny tastes of terror connected by a common ingredient. We serve up movie reviews, mysteries, murder, mayhem, and tantalizing tales from the depths of the internet and some random bullshit too, all focused around a similar theme. We blend our love of horror, oddities, and general creepiness and dig a little deeper discovering the history, psychology, and truth behind your wildest fears. Join us, Ash and Jordan, as we descend into full darkness every Sunday, wherever you listen to podcasts. It's Creepy Tapas, y'all. What, what? Proud members of the Dark Cast Network. Yeah, no, I think that what you were doing is amazing because it does. When you said that there were already like eighth grade or I don't even know if you said they were eight years old or eighth graders already throwing up in the bathrooms, you know, trying to fit in this mold that society has created that we're all supposed to fit in. And it's not right. And I mean, it's all it's going to do is self-destruct children. That's what it's designed to do. Well, the problem is it's because every generation has been dealing, I mean, our, our, you know, my, I'm in my fifties and it's like, we went through it. And then our, our mothers went through it. And our, I mean, there was always the grapefruit diet and the, this diet and the, can you pinch an inch thing for cereals? And I mean, it was just, and, and back then when I was growing up there, there weren't, there was no opposing message of positivity. So it was, we had diet ads in magazines. We had diet ads on TV and on the radio. And it was just all about it being as skinny as you can. And, um, I remember my sister's Cosmopolitan magazine and they'd always have the front stats on the, on the supermodel and what she weighed and how tall she was. I mean, it was just, that was the pressure constantly. And, and the statistics were showing that girls in high school would start smoking so that they would not eat as much. I mean, there, there was, cause it was, you're more, we were more afraid of gaining weight than we were of cancer. You know, I mean, that's, and I relate to that. I get that. That's how I lived for a big part of my life. And so, you know, you've got this, these messages um forever then without even knowing it oftentimes we're passing those messages on to our kids even if we don't mean to i mean a lot of a lot of women i spoke to i mean they they tried their best to um be as as positive and give as healthy messages as they could to their kids but at the same time the kids were hearing them put their own bodies down or no mommy's not going to have a piece of cake because mommy gained some weight or did stuff and those are the messages that your kids are hearing. And so it, it's so much more insidious. It's so much deeper than people think. And eating disorders are so much more vicious than people think. I used to say it's not a vanity thing. It's a sanity thing. You know, I was, I mean, it was, uh, I, I really, I talk about in the book that the one night I remember lying in bed and, and feeling that my heart was stopping. And I think I was probably 18. And thinking I should probably eat something because I probably had eaten two apples that day for like, and that had been my, the most I'd eaten in weeks. And I should go eat something. And then I thought, well, what if I'm not dying? And I eat something and I didn't need to eat it. So I had the, I mean, I was more afraid of gaining weight than, than I was of dying. And that's, that's the reality for a lot of people. And it still is. I'm grateful now that as crazy as life is with the internet and social media, which is brutal at least there is some, at least there are some, there are places you may have to look for it, but there are plenty of places to hear some positivity. I mean, you are seeing people who are showing their bodies going, this is me and this is what healthy could be. And we didn't have that growing up. So it's just looking for it, but it's something that has gone on forever. People ask me all the time, do you think it's gotten better? I'm like, oh, it's gotten different. 
this is still something that's going to be an issue. It's gotten different. Yeah, I, I don't know if I could say that there's a healthier outlook today. I would like to say so because people are standing up for themselves more. And, you know, people right now you could pretty much identify as anything you want to be. You want to be a pizza pizza? You could be a piece of pizza. You know what I mean? Like It's a very, very, it's a very weird time. I know we seem to go from extreme to extreme. Now I'm waiting. I don't know if I'll still be around, but at some point I'm hoping things just kind of find their, find their place. Cause we do, we tend to go from one extreme to another extreme. And, uh, and that's such a problem because then, then there's always, always fighting, right? Because the, any, anytime we're an extreme, it just, you turn people off completely. So even, even if the idea behind something is good, when you get into the extremes, you just lose the masses. And so I just, I don't know. I wish there was just a, we find that place of common sense would be great, but I don't know if that'll, <laughs> I don't know. I can't imagine. It just seems like the world's getting crazier and crazier. It really is. Unfortunately. Yes. I say like one of my main goals is to bring awareness to like generational trauma and childhood trauma, because that is a cycle that also repeats. And We've got to get to the bottom of it. We got to be able to see when we are doing these things to our children. And like you said, we have to watch the way that we talk to ourselves. I've had to learn that big time. Oh, because yeah. oh yeah. I was the first one to always be like, you dumbass, or what the hell? You know what I mean? And it's like, no, 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 no. Let's like replace that dumbass with like silly. <laughs> You're so silly. <laughs> silly good. Yeah. <laughs> But we have to, because when your children see you do that, not only will they maybe start looking at you the way you see you, yeah. and that's not mm-hmm. what you want, but then they might be like, well, then that must mean I am too. Exactly. Exactly. And I think women are the most at fault for this because, I mean, I, I still, I, I, I preach against doing this and then I catch myself doing it where someone will say, you know, oh, you're, you look great. And I'm like, oh no, I look tired. or something, you know, and it's like, we can't just own it and be like, thank you. Or whatever we do. We, I think we really put a lot of pressure on ourselves. And I think also as women, we were when oftentimes when a woman comes across when she's confident, she can come across as arrogant. And I think it could be seen as a negative, like, Oh, she thinks she's so hot. Oh, she thinks she's so. So I think a lot of times we're apologetic for when we feel good about ourselves. And I think that has to change. I think that, you know, little girls need to say, and I say little girls only because I think oftentimes, uh, and I raise boys. And so I, my, their confidence was always very important to me. So I'm not, I'm not minimizing it. I know boys, listen, boys struggle with a lot of different things in the same body image sphere. But I think that a perfect example of this is I remember there was a book that came out years ago. It was, it was such a thing where uh, parents were upset, some parents, because it was the same company put out these two books that looked the same. One was for boys and one was for girls. And for boys, it was like how to be powerful. It was how to be a good speaker, how to be a leader. And for the girl, it was how to be beautiful and how to be polite and how to be. And and that's the thing. I think that so girls are kind of taught just, you know, be, be pretty, be nice, be. And it's OK to not be pretty. It's OK to not be nice sometimes. It's OK to just be and feel and do and be loud and be opinionated and, you know, and, and, and I think that, um, that's something that girls will see, boys will see from not what their parents say, but from what they do. So just like you said, like I can say, oh, it's okay to have a voice. But then if they were to see me speaking negatively about myself or let somebody else put me down, then that's what they're going to, that's what they're going to emulate. Not what I said, but what they saw, how they saw me in action. So I do think it's very important that we're, that we're careful about that, you know, the, the messages that we give ourselves. But yeah, it's a, t- it's a tough one. And I've said, I've said in my first book, um, for parents is even if you have to lie, like, you know, that's the one time I say it's okay to lie to your kids. Like, you know, even if you're not feeling great about yourself, it's okay to tell them that you love yourself, you know, cause the more you say it to yourself, the more you start to, to believe it too. But, but it's, it's really, it's, it's important for them to know that it's okay to be proud of yourself. Right. And it's okay to fail at things. It's okay. You know, I had a really big problem with that. I didn't want to try anything because I was scared I was going to fail. 
So many people. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I do. I say that it's, I think at the end of my book, it's that if there's anything, like I think my, what my kids will learn from me. I mean, I hope they learn a lot of things from me, but I think that they, that they'll see that I am imperfect. I mean, I always say with my mother, I think, uh, I, I do think she was the perfect mother. And now she would, I don't think she, um, believed that. I think she was hard on herself, but she to me was perfection and not because she was perfect because she was, I got to see her imperfect, but still amazing. And that taught me, oh, I could not be perfect and still be a good mother. And I, and I think that they'll, because I'm so honest about where I've been, because I'm so honest about my, let's say mistakes or missteps, let's say, but they, I think they know I'm a good person. They, and I, they know I love them and, and they see the good I do. And, and as hard as I've been on myself, I don't believe anymore that they think I'm any less than as a mom or as a human being, because I've made mistakes. And I think that is a really important lesson for your, your kids to see. I never want my kids to be afraid to to make mistakes. I never want my kids to, to be afraid to try something because they're afraid it won't work out ever, ever, ever. You know, I never want that. And so to put that kind of pressure on them, if I put that on myself, that's such a, that's such a shame because you're making their life so small. You know, you got to try and fear it's fear and it's Fear not so much about failing, it's fear about what other people are going to think if you fail. That's really what it comes down to. Because if you fail, you fail. You know, if you fail and, and nobody knows about it, it's not such a big deal. But I think we're so afraid of what other people are going to think. You know, we're not going to change from one job to another job if you're successful in one job, but you really want to do something else. And if you fail and people are going to go, what an idiot. They left that. Who cares? You know, if you leave a relationship and then who cares? Like just, uh, it's, this is the time. Like, this is, you have one go around. Make as many mistakes to find your thing, you know? And let me tell you, there's stories in, <laughs> there's stories in those mistakes. <laughs> oh, Maybe yeah. worth having, you know what I mean? So there you go. There's always a story. The worst, oh, the worst, you got a story. There you go. <laughs> yes, usually. What, what do they say? Um, it'll come to me when we're done. <laughs> Okay. I, think I, know, I think I, I think I, I know. There's a quote. Are you thinking about something about the past? Yes. So, yeah, I know. And I can't remember either, but I know what you're, I know. I know what you're thinking though. It's like the best story. Like the best from stories. The... Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's true. Like you have to spread your wings. You have to make mistakes. You have to make stupid choices. Like you just, you have to, because you're going to well, we about... know all the answers. Yeah, and, and you learn, you learn about other people and you learn what not to do and you learn who not to trust and you learn who you can trust and you learn, uh, you know, and some of those lessons are painful, but, th- but they're survivable, you know, and, and I'm really somebody who <laughs> right or wrong, I will, I won't ever take the safe, the easy route, which isn't, isn't great because it'd be so great if things were just easy for, di- but I won't take the, I have got the thought of being stuck in something because it's safe whether it's a, a, a job or a relationship or anything like that, because it's safe. That's my biggest, biggest fear is just because I, I've done that before. I felt stuck and I don't, I don't want that. I don't want, there's a great, but now I'm thinking of a quote that I can't really think of, but it was from, it's from the movie Steel Magnolias <laughs> with Julia Roberts. And she says something like she would trade like a minute or like they all trade five minutes She'd rather have five minutes of amazing than a lifetime of nothing special. And, and I like that, you know, I'd rather go for it and make mistakes and not happen or, or just have, I want, I want whatever it is I'm doing. I want to feel passionate about it. I want to feel excited about it. I don't want safe ends. Okay. I don't want, okay. You know, which comes sometimes leaves me with what the fuck, but (laughs) that's okay. I think I'm somebody who's more comfortable in the what the fuck that I am in the, okay. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's growth. There you go. There you go. <laughs> like you said, that, that's growth. <laughs> <laughs> Was there anything else that you wanted to add? No, you know what? I think, like I said, like we've said, it's kind of been a, a bit of a theme for this thing. It's that you got one go around and I hate cliches. So I know this kind of sounds like a cliche, but man, you know, we we got to stop worrying so much about what we did, about what's going to happen. Like I'm somebody who, much to my friend's dismay, I, I, I'm somebody who lives day to day. Like I really do. If you, if, if you say to me, oh, there's something happening like three months from now, I'm like, 
I'm sorry. Like talk to me in three days. Like I really don't, I, I, because also my life has shown me like, I don't know what's going to be. Are we are ready for going to be here in three days? Like I don't even, know. but honestly, like I try to live, I try to take each moment and when it's a bad moment, I accept that it's a bad moment. And then when it's a good moment, I take that it's a good moment. If I feel like crying, I'll cry. If I feel like dancing, I'll dance. And I, I honestly have gotten to the point where I do not care what other people think. I truly, truly do not care what other people think. I want to be a good person. You know, I don't, I don't want to think I'm not a good person, but uh, my boundaries, let me tell you, from somebody who had no boundaries, my boundaries are so high <laughs> and <laughs> so strong. No, because I think we need to stop worrying so much about, um, just we, I think we, a lot of us deplete ourselves. You know, we let ourselves just get drained from trying to be everything to everyone. And there's a great expression too that says, don't worry about being liked by everyone. You don't even like everyone. Right. And that's true. Like, have you seen people? <laughs> right. Great these days. So, <laughs> so don't worry about it. But, um, yeah. So, so I think my thing is just live your life as loud as you want it to be and don't worry about how it looks to anybody else. It's your life. It doesn't have to make sense to anybody but you. I love that. Absolutely. And I think we all do struggle with that for sure. We care mm -hmm. too much what everybody else thinks. Write a book about the, your deepest, darkest secrets and you won't care as much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's you all out there. It's all out there. <laughs> So I care what picture I put up. I care what, please, like I, listen, I've talked about, <laughs> you know, my stuff. So yeah. Aren't you glad social media wasn't around when you were doing all that? So, <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, like there weren't even cell phones really. I don't, I can't even, there were, but it was, it was not, there weren't, you weren't taking pictures and, oh yeah. I know. <laughs> well, listen, we say that, but then I wrote about it anyway, but at least there's no picture evidence. I guess that's. <laughs> exactly. And it's not, yeah, I guess that's, yeah. Oh God, I can't even, I can't even imagine. Whew. I think about that sometimes like, oh Lord. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, that, that's that's a, it's a whole, I imagine a whole different, I can't, the, the, listen, I, I grew up in the eighties and seventies, eighties. And I, I'm often like, just take me back just for a bit. Like it just seemed so much simpler. Really did. I mean, I sound so old, but you know, it was all I'm right behind you. I mean, you know, the music, the fashion, the lack of fashion, but I mean, it was, it was great, but it's a, every, listen, every decade has its challenge. Every generation has its challenge. It's just, we need to, no, we need to work together and find that we're just not. And it's just, it's exhausting. So honestly, whatever it is that, what is it? Cranks your chain or rocks your boat or whatever, whatever it is that, that, <laughs> The does it for you, do it. Find something. The world is on fire. It's a freaking dumpster fire. Whatever it is that makes you happy, <laughs> find it. Find it and do it and do it often. And that's it. <laughs> Absolutely. My, I my words and advice, my words of wisdom. Hey, I think they're good words. Thanks. You're very wise. <laughs> oh, thanks. Hey, comes with the age. <laughs> well, if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, what would be the best way? Um, okay. Well, my book, so The Good Stripper, A Soccer Mom's Memoir of Lies, Loss, and Lap Dances is available on Amazon or as an audiobook on Audible. Um, and I'm all over social media. So Facebook, um, Instagram, um, TikTok a little bit. Um, but it's Marcy Warhat's just my name and you can reach out. Um, and if you read my book and want to talk to me about it, I'd love to chat. So, uh, so look me up, check me out. <laughs> Google me. <laughs> Google me. Oh yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being on. This was fun. Thanks. It was fun. Yeah, it was really fun. Thanks. Yes. I think we all know somebody who can benefit from this episode. Please make sure to share it with them. And thank you guys so much for listening to my podcast. This really means a lot to me. If one of my episodes has helped you in any way, I would really like to know. It's important for me to know that the work that I'm doing is actually helping people. If you want more of me, make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow me on Instagram and TikTok. If you or anyone you know is in need of 
national hotlines, please go to truecrimeconnections.com. I have all the phone numbers there listed for anything that you could possibly imagine. All right, my renowned Roots community, keep building hope and gaining strength. Until next time. Thank <laughs> you.